book, Gentle Northern Summer. Um, George, uh, both George and Bill are, are writers of uh, great distinction. Uh, we're happy to have in uh, working in our departments here, in our in English department. Um, and I think it's all too rare that the really splendid writers we have in our department are, are uh, uh, a little too invisible or in unaudible, in <laughs> unheard. <laughs> um, uh, George's uh, latest book, as I mentioned, uh, Gentle Northern Summer, will be, I hope, uh, winning the BC Book Prize. <laughs> I don't know. Have you seen any shortlist for that one well, yet? Well, it all depends on Susan Hudson. Oh, is she on the jury? She's reviewing it for the Sun. Oh, well, there you go. And um, uh, the, George's last big book was Opening Day, which was uh, a marvelous book as well. So um, please um, welcome George Stanley. Thank you, Sharon. I'm going to uh, start, uh, oh, I think I should start by reading my greatest hits. <laughs> this is, refers to a wonderful uh, little interchange between uh, Barry McKinnon and Al Purdy when Barry had come down to Fraser Valley to do a reading and he read uh, new experimental work and it didn't go over and uh, he was depressed about that. He was back up in Prince George and Al happened to be there so he was mentioning this to Al and Al said, Barry, don't you understand, when you're doing a reading like that, just read your greatest hits. Yeah. So. <laughs> of course. <laughs> right. Stuff they can understand. Make them laugh, make them cry. That's right, yes. <laughs> OK, um, I'm going to start by reading a couple of poems from 1986 book, published, a uh, chap book, published by uh, Gorse Tatlow Press. Editors Barry McKinnon and David Phillips. At the union meeting. At the union meeting in the boardroom, orange cushioned thrones roll on casters, legs dangle, ankles brush. Outside, the cafeteria's tall windows reflect mountains and air, gray and sometimes cold. And that's a very hard line to read. Outside, let me start the whole poem again. At the union meeting. At the union meeting in the boardroom, orange cushioned thrones roll on casters, legs dangle, ankles brush. Outside, the cafeteria's tall windows reflect mountains and air, gray, and sometimes cold sun admitting, say, fall, though it is still calendar summer. The lights and agenda make a world for us. Nothing we have to do but sit in the boss's chairs and talk insurance, long-term disability, the carrier. Faces dwindle, go sidewise, out of character. I see Rosie's face still thoughtful but not moving on to the next moment. I see the shape of the whole world. Now it has a shape, distorted, carried by the word carrier, a crushed box, a brig, carried cholera upstream to Quebec, later typhus. In Venice in 1911, when Aschenbach saw Tadziu, this morning on Zowski, a woman lost her home, fought 24D and 245T and lost, legal to spray now in Nova Scotia. The word long, too, speaks of extent. Worlds break down sometimes without a word, or is the word heard later when I am called home by a loss, unsecured, and passing through the mall or airport, glimpse my form in TV screen or window, also passing. Look away quick from the glass, back to a world that lasts in moments of our ignorance. And this is called Pub Night. This I record, that listening to you talk, my mind half on you and half on the variousness of what you were saying, it struck me that love is true, not just real, not just a sentiment. I was afraid I might forget this, so I grabbed a cigarette pack that was lying on the table, tore off the top and wrote, 
Truth has a double value, obverse, reverse. A couple of days later, I find it in my pocket, and I taped it in my writing book under this quotation from Duncan. I never made any vow to poetry except to cut its throat if I could make somebody laugh. <laughs> the tab of the cigarette pack has an obverse, too. It says, players, filtre. You can't beat, rien ne surpasse, the taste of le goût des players, players. And by obverse reverse, I mean one truth, I hope, not two. Not a scattered, shattered love falling through endless darkness, but a mystery, plain and simple as a glass of beer, and needing many of same to perceive, no doubt, but when perceived, perceived with a lessening of tension as something simpler than terror. Could I get a glass of water, if possible? Yeah. Well, could you get me one, please? I'll wait. So that line of Duncan's, while well, I won't continue to sharing this back, uh, I never made any vow to poetry except to cut his throat if I could make somebody laugh. That was during one of the great Spicer-Duncan wars in San Francisco, when Spicer said that Duncan had sold out to New York, as usual, you know, and this tremendously moralistic tone. And uh, Duncan just laughed it off and said that. I never made any vow to poetry except to cut his throat if I could make somebody laugh. Okay. I'll read one more of these because this was a book, I think, when I sort of felt I had gotten my whole modernist bag of tricks together. New poem, it's called, because I thought this is a new kind of poem. So a new poem <laughs> has an epigraph. Human speech has melody, and its song communicates as well as its libretto. Joseph Weizenbaum from a book called uh, Computer Power and Human Reason. Imperceptibly, the fantasies dwindle in this mind. Riding the bus into the dusk, I could feel them losing color. The eternal mountains across the Skeena, I thought. Beyond, the lighter, darkening sky, streaked with color toward the Pacific, alive, as edged by the ribbed collar of your T-shirt, your ionic skin. The bombs waiting in silos, the mind solitary, students to be seen, tests returned, the videotape controlling interest delivered to Jeannie at the fish hall. On TV, Ruth Buzzy beats Don Heron on the head and shoulders with her purse, which she later says is special, no hardware fittings to injure. Look, at this moment in the mind, someone is waiting, someone more than patient, someone who smiles, someone is waiting forever for the bomb for the song of your voice. Moments of meaninglessness, like that one on the bus. Mind can deny anything, sinks. Oh no, it's not, nothing, just extension, electron wave probability packets, phonemes, strings processed by my or your processor in series, parallel, linear, even laughter, nothing simultaneous, a single series, on TV, a double burger, come at the moment of change, as if mind, in moving, processing, lost its hold in the manifold, slipped the categories, color, love, and then the smile from the infinitesimal. OK, I'll read some from uh, Gentle Northern Summer. I guess I'll read uh, Terrace 87. Let's see, there's a couple of uh, notes to this one. Uh, Dudley Little, who is mentioned here, is a, was a mill owner and an MLA, and he was the son of George Little, who was known, he was known as the founder of Terrace. 
And Sam Clark is the title character in Frederick Philip Grove's 1944 novel, The Master of the Mill. Terrace 87. High snow on rock a word. I sit in my camp chair aware. Distance is false. All is here in the sky. Then giant cracks break the summer air, courtesy Kitimat Chamber of Commerce. I hear Nechaco raindrops falling inside a mountain, river torn from valley, chained head down in a tunnel, drives turbines till pure inanimate power shines forth. I see the Alcan shareholder smile, slitting open his broker's statement. <laughs> At the Inn of the West, some still call the lake else. The terrace chamber in fern-filled morning sunlight dreams, energy-intensive industries, technology and elixir, jobs for the youth, remembering when they last felt young, sales were up, there was a kid to boss around the store. Capital, Dudley Little said it years ago, without Columbia Cellulose, now Westar, we'd be nothing. Grant us our lifestyle. I see now the young Niska, heir to skinned hills, rotting stumps, tree farm license one, dance backwards into Gregg Avenue, away from the enraged white man with the pool cue, and I think he's a raindrop, skipping over the land until he splashes. And settler boys, not talking, stand in sapling clumps with rock star hair, or roll along the avenue, on big wheels and cut out pipes, going somewhere, going where the pavement goes, to the corner, trained to want. The mill or smelter, a shiny device to the eyes of rotary on its long coffee break. Boys go in, workers come out with credit cards, neat. But it's Sam Clark's mill. It doesn't need any workers. It doesn't even have any floors. It's self-lubricating. Maybe just the occasional polishing rag. All we wanted was a free ride. Is that too much to ask? All we wanted was that moment when you pass and the other guy's face is blank behind glass. Then the blank guy wants to pass. <laughs> and if the fish flop spawning on the Chaco gravel beds, Jose plays a lot of list lately. There are no words for the fish, the Indians said, shared their lives with us. Our food comes by truck. The boys laugh. Maybe we'll have to fight for this land. And their dads think tourism. <laughs> and their dads think the kids don't want to work anyway. It's what they teach them. Big corporations have all the money anyway. Let them create the jobs. Fall. The rainstorm shoots long logs down the slopes, jams the culvert, caves the road. Tractor trailers stack up, our food, our body, our lifestyle. December, colored lights sketch houses of family. Arms control descends like a gift of titans. This is uh, Gorbachev and Reagan in, in Iceland. Like little pre-Christian men imagined Thor or Russian serfs a good czar. Up where satellites crawl, Star Wars lasers, powered by Earth's rivers may streak. Today benevolence speaks, sublunary commanders, and we've never been so far from the stars that were our friend. Okay, one more from this collection. Because I want to get two from the, for two newer poems. I guess I'll read the puck, since, it's, since the Canucks have lost six in a row now. <laughs> hmm? This will help them out. The puck skids, skitters. Sometimes it rolls, then it's harder to whack in. The attackers cross the blue line. Pass to the point. He shoots. Players pile up in the crease. The goaltender sprawls. Whistle. Where's the puck? 
Face off in the defender's zone. The two players edge forward. Sticks descend. The linesman slams it down. It's back in play. The puck must always be in play. That's a, a rule of the National Hockey League, by the way. The puck must always be in play. Draw back to the stands, the thousands of fans. One is saying, watch the puck. The other, watch Bure, it'll come to him. Draw back further through the TV cameras, the cable, the tube, in a dazzle of pixels, the game on in the living room. The curtain slightly drawn, spring evening entering. Watch the puck. Start to tell a story, ask a question, change the subject, and hey, they score. <laughs> Bure or Linden or Ronning, arms raised in triumph, flies into his teammate's embrace. Second period, light a joint. Now watch the puck for dear life. <laughs> the puck is life, like a word. The huge surrounding fucked reality. Sense of your body hunched and the doomed city. Ah, but they're on the screen, white knights, Canucks. You know them, know their names, know the rules, sophisticate, obedient as they. Then a commercial, cars or beer, and all about the cliffs of fall, not running. Cliffs of fall is a quote from Hopkins. You remember yourself and forget the puck. You are like Prometheus on the rock. You can't fall. The car drives into your head and is wedged there. The TV set with a car for a head, the pterodactyl is eating you. <laughs> Third period. Now the beer is heavy in your head, and the dope keeps calling you back to your damned self. Nonetheless, you know what you must do. Keep your eye on that black blur, or miss the pass. Okay, all right. Um, mm -hmm. Don't worry about the time. I'm looking at the time. Okay, I'll go on reading all night. Yeah, I'll read one more from, uh, go back and read one more from this uh, San Jose poem. This is a kind of a, I have this long San Francisco poem, which is uh, sort of my own tribute to my parents, and then almost as a kind of addendum to this, the San Jose poem is for my mother's sister, Catherine Hennessy, uh, whose name in religion was Sister Maureen. Starting in April, sadness carried forward from Catherine's death which I have not mourned, in April, in April sadness, how the city of San Jose stands in my mind, the B of A with its bellless tower, hot 5 p.m. walking east on Santa Clara, cross market and first, preserved facades, south between second and third, sun on car roofs, blocks raised to keep Mexicans from crossing, some stores left hang banners in Vietnamese. South of Keys were orchards. Sunday afternoons, we drove to orchards, a gray DeSoto or Dodge sedan, moving slowly down gravel roads, quarter sections of trees, geometrically spaced, watered, the gray coast hills beyond. Visitors, we parked in front of a small barn, were allowed to walk in among the trees, reached into our hands and mouths, Santa Clara plums, a sweet green fig, ripe apricots. Our friends gave us balsa cartons to take fruit back to the city. Catherine came to San Jose as superior of the convent, her last assignment. 12 years, she had been superior of the order. At her funeral mass, Gerald said in his homily, she was not one of the foolish virgins, nor would she have been one of the sensible virgins either, refusing, refusing oil to her foolish sisters, telling them to go downtown and buy some. She would have been in the Lord's house already, placing a, a glass of ginger ale and a cookie in the room of each one arriving home late. <laughs> As she came to the side door of the Hayes Street convent in San Francisco with wax paper sandwiches of cabbage and mashed potato for men who lined up in the Depression, Catherine entered the Sisters of the Holy Family in 1930. The order, since 1872, patronized by Irish banks, 
established day homes for children of poor in San Jose cannery workers. The fruit left by train, the trees sucked the water out of the ground and it left as fruit. Water in a well, Santa Clara and Delmas, 150 feet, 1950. The sisters lived in underheated California Baroque luxury, mahogany paneling. <laughs> Sister Thomasine held me as a child. Last year, Sister Daniel, her sister, served shrimp salads, steaks, rolls, ice cream and coffee to Catherine and me in the Superior's dining room. These people are still alive and live on St. Elizabeth's Drive in San Jose, and they are dead and live in this poem with the often repetitive movements of the dead, drawing in a skirt just so as to be remembered in rooms filled with spring sunlight and my mother's spotless furniture. Leaving the convent, dazed, dazzled by goodness, I'd go back to the Holiday Inn, generously contemptuous of the ones who ate avocado salads in the Hawaiian coffee shop or played video games in the black alcove, and on leaving the inn, walk up Almaden, past the offshore banks, the orchards burnt and dozed when electronics came. Think of recent Santa Clara grads hoping to retain the software concession, steal the yup trade from Mountain View, fill the new civic center with suits, music, beds of flowers, and sprinklers. In the old day homes, these virgins were my mothers. I was treated as poor. On the polished hardwood floor, rolling in play pants, in black habit and stiff white coif, Thomasine bends to offer panuche on a glass plate. Downstairs, admitted to the work areas, the stone-floored kitchen, Sister Malachi supervising, two Spanish women baking, door open on a walled garden, a red or yellow watering can, geraniums, tall bending stalks of snapdragon. Catherine remembers me asking questions. Is it all right? No, my mother's voice. Is it all wrong? None smiling. One eternal moment, the content of the other as we sit talking. Okay, then I'll read a couple from a uh, new magazine called Ted's. One of the editors of whom, of which just came in, Reg Johansson from SFU. So this is uh, probably all out of, probably no more copies left. It's probably worth a thousand dollars. There are still some more copies of Tad's. So I'll read two poems. This, this is my poem on the money market. The power of the unhappy people. The unhappy people have great power. They invest in the unhappiness of others. Not generic unhappiness, the kind of unhappiness anyone could feel, but designer unhappiness, <laughs> the exact shape of the hole in your heart. <laughs> These are dreams without doors. Let the blonde demonstrator slip one around your feelings. As it goes on, it clings like shrink wrap. Now the birds can cry in the night and you won't hear them, or your ancestors or jazz. The image of your death will dance for you with as many veils as you please. In your fog-colored room, in your Queen Anne chair, you may wish you were dead, but be glad of that wish, since it set you above the common sort, inured to ordinary unhappiness. And we, the investment community, will grin. <laughs> Though like you, we cannot feel the sun, or hear the rain, or jazz. We will grin at the thought of you dreaming. More and more people must become rich and unhappy so the original unhappy people can die rich. <laughs> okay, two, two more poems. This is a medium length one and the other one's very short. This is, call, uh, this is called The Wasteland. It's a translation um, the text I was working from was a uh, prose piece in Cité Libre written by, uh, uh, done by uh, uh, Lionel Manet in French, and he is translating it from a prose piece written by a Russian writer named Arkady Cherkasov. So it's from Russian, from into French, and then 
into English, but then I made a poem rather than a prose piece out of it. The Wasteland, a translation. I'm going to tell you a story, but it's not really a story. It's not all in the past. It's happening now. On a fall evening in the outskirts of Moscow, I was walking alone down a little path through a wasteland. I heard voices singing. Then I saw them, a noisy gang, five or six young guys apparently drunk, shouting a song. No way to turn back, to run away in shame. I kept walking toward them, gripping my keys in my pocket, thinking no good will come of this. Then I recognized the song. They were singing Tum Balalaika, or trying to sing it, in Yiddish, like Jews. One young man knew the verse, the others came in on the chorus. Spiel Balalaika, Tum Balalaika. I felt relieved. I remembered that this was a holy day for the Jews, and here were our Judaizing Russian youth singing after synagogue. No harm from them. Shalom, guys, I said, and they, all in a chorus, replied, Shalom, Grandpa. They backed off, and I went on my way, filled with sad thoughts. Not because they had called me Grandpa, though it did seem a little early for that, <laughs> but because I asked myself, how have we come to the point where a Russian, an Orthodox Christian, has to be afraid of young Russians, but not of those who would call themselves Jews? Then another thought. Young people, will you leave this country? It is not a bad country. We could share it with you. The ones I had feared to meet tonight, they are not going anywhere. Who would take them? But you will probably go. And then the chance that my next meeting with strangers in the wasteland at night will be an unpleasant one, that chance will have increased greatly. Young people, don't leave. Look, I will plant trees in this barren place. We will start our lives again. You are ours. You are Russians like us. What matter who our ancestors were? Slavs, Swedes, Finns, Turks, or Jews. Alexander Pushkin himself belongs to all of us, whose grandfather was an Ethiopian and his grandmother German from Estonia. But those who for 10 years now, with the methodical passion of drunks, have broken the glass panes of the bus shelter in our street, glass, pane, glass panes replaced no less methodically by the municipality of Moscow, them I don't consider Russians, even if their name were, names were pop off three times over. They don't love this land. It is alien to them. It would be better if they would leave Russia and go live somewhere in the Soviet Union. But as for Boris Finkelstein, with whom I have planted birch trees in the wasteland to make more beautiful as best we could this corner of our poor Russia that we share, I think that there is no one more Russian than he and I don't want him to leave, for without him there will be fewer birch trees here. Fewer still, since our Soviet drunks keep breaking the saplings, and each spring we have to plant new ones. <clears throat> huh. I can read a couple more, can't I? <laughs> no, I only got one more. Just one more poem. Very short poem called uh, Family Eyes. Whether by blood or mere authority, this knowledge, eyes look out of an awful lostness, lost and found on earth together. The eyes of friends are beautiful jewels. The eyes of lovers are perilous mirrors. Family eyes scope the skulking soul. Thank you.